3, we continue in our study through the book of Daniel. Daniel chapter 3. Beginning in verse number 1. Nebuchadnezzar the king made an image of gold whose height was three score cubits. That's about 90 feet tall. Pretty good size um, image. And the breadth thereof six cubits. That about nine feet wide. And then it says, He set it up in the plain of Dura, in the province of Babylon. Then Nebuchadnezzar the king sent to gather together the princes, the governors, the captains, the judges, the treasurers, the counselors, the sheriffs, and all the rulers of the provinces to come to the dedication of the image which Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. Then, uh, no, jump to verse 4. Then an herald cried aloud, To you it is commanded, O people, nations, and languages, that at what time ye hear the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, sackbut, psaltery, dulcimer, and all kinds of music, ye fall down and worship the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king hath set up. And whoso falleth not down and worshipeth shall the same hour be cast into the midst of of a burning, fiery furnace. Therefore, at that time, when all the people heard the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, sackbut, psaltery, and all kinds of music, all the people, the nations, and the languages fell down and worshipped the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. Wherefore, at that time, certain Chaldeans came near and accused the Jews, accused Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, okay? They spake and said to the king, Nebuchadnezzar, O king, live forever. Thou, O king, hast made a decree that every man that shall hear the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, sackbut, psalter, and dulcimer, and all kinds of music shall fall down and worship the golden image. Whoso falleth not down and worshipeth, that he should be cast into the midst of the burning fiery furnace. There are certain Jews whom thou hast set over the affairs of the provinces of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, have not regarded thee. They serve not thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar, in his rage, and fury commanded to bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Then they brought these men before the king. Nebuchadnezzar spake and said unto them, Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? Do not ye serve my gods, nor worship the golden image which I have set up? Now, if you be ready that at what time you hear the sound of the cornet and the instruments, you shall fall down and worship the image which I have made, well, but if you worship not, you shall be cast the same hour into the midst of a burning fiery furnace. And who is that God that shall deliver you out of my hands? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer thee in this matter. If it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace. He will deliver us out of thine hand, O king. But if not, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. The question or title for our thought is, who or what are you going to worship? Daniel chapter 3 is about the subject of worship. There are words that describe it, that show the emphasis of the chapter. We find this little statement, set up. We find it nine times in the chapter. Set up. Something is set up. People set up. People, places, things, 
unbiblical ideologies, all kinds of things are set up and prominent, preeminent, just like the king's doing here. Set up. The words fell or fall down are found seven times in the chapter. And that speaks of a person's yielding themselves or their allegiance and admiration, ador adoration of, uh, towards something. Right? And so they fell down. It has to do with worship. Falling down before. Then there's the word image. It's found 11 times in the chapter. And then there's the word worship. And it's found 11 times in the chapter. So we're dealing with the subject of worship, aren't we? Setting something up as preeminent. An image is to be bowed down to, yielded to, respected, reverenced. And then worship is the issue. And thank God that there were three in the whole crowd who said, King will have you to know that we're not worshiping any other God ever than the true and living God. And we need some Hananiah, Mishael's, and Azariah's, uh, their Hebrew names, or as we better know them, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego's in our day. So let's look at this subject and see some uh, truths about worship in the chapter. First truth that I see is in verse number one. And it's this truth. Humans make images and idols and show an unhealthy allegiance and adoration for them. Humans make images and idols. Look at verse number one. Nebuchadnezzar, the king, made an image of gold and he set it up. He placed it in a place of preeminence. See, there's a problem here. There's a problem here because God Almighty has already spoken about the matter. In Exodus chapter 20, we, if we could read those first six verses of the 20th chapter, the very f first two commandments of the Ten Commandments declare to us clearly uh, that God forbids image worship. He says, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. That doesn't mean that there are any other gods because there aren't any go other gods. There's only one true and living God. But it's, see, what he's saying is you've got all of these plurality of gods. You've made things that are you call God that aren't even God. But he said, I don't want any of that before me that is before my face. There's the first commandment God gives to us out of the ten. No substitute gods. And then he said, not on that, neither shalt thou make unto thee any graven images to bow down unto them. That's the second commandment of the Ten Commandments. Don't make any graven images. Don't make something that's going, that you're going to bow down to that's not me. God says. So there's a problem. God's already spoken about it. There's only one real God. He demands allegiance to Him from us. Allegiance to Him. He forbids substitutes. You were created this morning to worship the true and living God. But something's happened. Fallen, sinful humanity has decided that He can make His own gods. And so humans tend to look for substitutes to worship. We tend to look for a God that we like. So we fashion our own gods. And we make them like we want God to be. And we fabricate someone that we think we can control. I mean, you can make an image and you can control the thing. King Nebuchadnezzar, even if it's 90 feet tall, he can do whatever he wants to with it. If he wants to cut it down, he'll cut it down. He'll do whatever he wants to. We make our own rules about worship. We make our own rules about what God's like. Or what we want God to be like. Well, we only want God to be positive, nothing negative. We, we only want the love of God. Don't bring anything out about the judgment of God. 
or the anger of God or the wrath of God. Right? We make Him like we want Him to be. Oh, preach about sweet heaven! And really we'd like for you to just say that everybody's going. That's what we'd like to preach. But that's not truth. We also have to preach about hell. And not everybody's going to heaven. Only those who have genuinely repented of sins and relied wholeheartedly on the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior. We make our own rules about worship. What we, what he's like, how to worship him. It, there, there's a pile of people who have no interest in church. Well, my heart has always been knit to the church since I've been saved. And the reason being is because God ordained it. And if God, there are a lot of people who think they can worship just when they want, however they want, you know, wherever they want. Listen to me, they haven't read their Bible. The Word of God is very clear that God instituted, implemented, ordained, sanctioned, began the local church. And the people of God are to get together around the Word of God and worship Him. We make our own rules about how we'll live our lives. Well, it doesn't make any difference if I'm immoral. See, we're trying to make God to fit into what we like and what we want Him to be. We want to control God. But the problem is this. God will not be controlled. Albert Moeller said, Our hearts are idol-making factories. Something about the human heart that just wants to set something up but you know what it primarily pr comes to with humanity what it primarily comes to is it's a pride issue it's a, a self promotion issue it is about we want something that we want more than, than whatever God wants we're not interested so much in what God wants we're interested in what we want what's King Nebuchadnezzar doing he's making an image because he wants an image Right? And it's about self-promotion. He was back there in chapter 2. We saw the dream that he had and the interpretation that was that the head of that image was gold. And that was him and his kingdom. But now what do we got? He's making a whole 90-foot image that the whole thing's going to be gold. And apparently it's an image of him. Certainly representing him. And his kingdom. Pride is involved. Look, look at the next chapter. Verse number 30. The fourth chapter, verse number 30. Listen, listen to what Nebuchadnezzar says. This displays his pride. It says, verse 30. The king spake and said, Is not this great Babylon that I have built for the house of the kingdom by the might of of my power and for the honor of my majesty. <laughs> I think the king's a little bit wrapped up in himself, don't you? He's just wrapped up in himself. It's all about him. Oh, good. I'm, I'm the head of gold. That's all right. I'll become the head and the chest and the arms and the belly and the thighs and the hips and the legs and the feet. And I'll be everything's me. It's all about me. And I'm golden. <laughs> Pride. Pride says I deserve what I've got. Pride says I deserve more than what I have. Pride says I deserve for others to praise me. Pride says I don't need God. I can do it on my own. Pride says... I want to be above others. Give me a 90 foot image. Because I want to be above others.
Humans make images and idols. Humans make their own gods. But they make a god that's not the real god. They make a god with their own imagination. Oh, I think he's like this. And I think he's like that. And I want him to be like this. And so he is like that in my thinking. Well, the only problem is a person that does that is not worshiping the true God. They're worshiping a God of their own creation and their own concocted imagination. That's why it's so vital. That's why we have strived through the decades to make it so vital here that the Word of God's the authority. It is the verified, credible, precise Word of God to us. Proven to be so. And so, whatever we're about, whatever methods we're going to use, whatever thoughts we have about God must come from biblical truth. So that we we do have a standard. We do have revelation from God to us. And so we don't wind up becoming worshipers of a false God. Because you can do it. You can do it in a Baptist church. Become the worshiper of a false God. Number three. Humans make images and idols. Idolaters... Uh, right here. I'm missing it. Idolaters will try to turn you into idolaters. Disobeyers, those who disobey God will try to get you to disobey God. Look at it. Verse number one. Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar made an image and set it up. And then verse number two, it goes on. Look at the next verse. Then Nebuchadnezzar the king sent to gather together the princes, the governors, the captains, and all of this whole crowd to come to the dedication of the image. And now look at verse number four. Then a herald, the king's herald, cried aloud. And here's what he said. To, to you... To you it's commanded, O people, nations, and languages, that at what time you hear the sound of all of these instruments and the music, you shall fall down and worship the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king hath set up, and whosoever falleth not down and worshipeth shall the same hour be cast into the midst of a burning fiery furnace, saith the king. And the announcement's made after he commanded all the whole powers, princes, all of the kingdom's crowd. Get here when you get here. Here's the announcement. Worship this way or else. You know, people are not satisfied to be in sin alone. They want to drag others into sin with them. Here in Daniel 3, we have a government trying to force people to disobey God. And if they don't, they get to pay the consequences. You'll wish you had. They're trying to force social conformity for all. Right? That's what verse 7 says. Twice it says it. And it, it says, therefore at that time when all the people heard. Then it said all the people fell down and worshipped. All. It's government forced. Government forced. Social adherence. To disobey God. It reminds me of Revelation chapter number 13. Do you know the Bible says that there's coming a time in 
days just preceding the second coming of Christ that the government will force an antichrist government will force the building of an image and force everybody on the planet to worship the antichrist the beast and if they'll not do it you know what the consequences are? You won't be able to buy, sell, trade. You're going to have to get this mark of the beast. You're going to have to, and if you don't do it, then it's curtains for you. What's so interesting to me, forced. I, I thought about in our present situation, the mayor of New York City came out after he set the standards. And, and I'm for, I, I understand trying to protect people. I, right, exactly. But you know what? I, I don't even want to go through here. Why am I doing this? But one of the things that I saw, heard him say early on, was if you see your neighbor outside their house, you call the authorities and turn them in. That's exactly what we're going to come to in the Antichrist system before the Lord Jesus comes. Let me give you a passage. We, we have faced this kind of thing all the way through. Uh, Matthew chapter 10, all through history, it's gone on. Jesus told about it. Listen to Matthew chapter 10, just a few little verses here. Uh, Matthew 10 verse number 21 it says, and brother shall deliver up the brother to death, and the father of the child. And the children shall rise up against their parents, and cause them to be put to death. Is that an, Jesus said it. Is that an astounding thing? The chapter goes on then to say, think not that I've come to send peace on the earth. I came to send, not to send peace, but a sword. For I'm come to send a man, set a man at variance against his father. And the daughter against her mother, and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a man's foes shall be they of his own household. He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. He that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he that taketh not his cross and followeth after me is not worthy of me, Jesus said. But what, what has happened? What has happened throughout church history? It happened back in Daniel's day. You get to lose your life if you don't do what we're telling you to do. It happened throughout church history. The nonconformists, the reformists, the Anabaptists, they, what do they do? They, they wound up coming to light and truth of the Word of God and the way of salvation and things like that. And when they did, what happened? They wound up martyred. Look at martyr's mirrors. Bruce and I bought one at Greenville Bob Jones University, Greenville, South Carolina, when we was out there. Uh, martyrs mirrors. Or look at Fox Books of Martyrs. And, and just find out that there have been those who absolutely hate and attack and persecute those who will obey God. There is spiritual warfare going on. There are demonic powers that hate your guts if you do right. Yea, and all that live godly in Christ Jesus shall, it's a promise, shall suffer persecution. You can count on it that you're going to get some scuff if you do right. If you obey God. If you begin to live your life biblically. Amen. Yeah. Which brings us to our third thought here. If you refuse to uh, disobey God and refuse to go along with their false god and worships, worship, you will be attacked and persecuted. That's exactly what happens. What, what happens? Look at verse number 8 of the chapter. Wherefore, at that time, certain Chaldeans came near and accused the Jews. And then go to the king and tell the king, squeal on them. Turn them in. And then said verse number 12, There are certain Jews whom thou hast set over the affairs of, and province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men won't bow and worship the image which you have set up. So the authorities will not tolerate obedience to Christ. 
and disobedience to them. A fourth lesson or truth that I see in the chapter. The child of God must obey God and trust God even if it cost him or her their lives, his or her life. We must obey. We must trust. Even if it cost us our lives. The king offers a second chance. In verse number 13 through 15. They can change their minds. They can go ahead and just bow to the world's demands. If they will. But the Hebrews give their answer in verse 16 to 18. And what an answer it is. Look at it. Verse number 16. I would suggest it was a calm and courageous answer. The king, the king has called the men on this. And it says, verse 16, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer thee in this matter. We're not careful, full of care. We're not worried about this. We've made up our mind. This is where we're at. Now listen. With a fiery furnace just right over there. Ready to scald them and burn them. Fry them. They stand before the king. And they say, we don't even have to think about it. Calm and courageous. That's not natural. That is supernatural. That's God's help. Listen, if you obey God, God will help you. It was a calm and courageous answer. It was a confident answer. They, look what he says in verse 17. If it be so that we go to the fiery furnace, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace. That is, you talk about confidence going into it. God is able. They knew God is able. They are convinced God is able. We have to get convinced that God is able. Oh, but if I obey God, this, it won't work out. This is going to happen and something else is going to happen. And oh, what? This is going to bring some trouble. And this, listen, and we start thinking like that instead of thinking, okay, God said it. I, and He said if I obey, then He's going to tend to me. That's the confidence we need. God's able to make it all work out. All I got to do is just to do what God told me to do. Right? It was a confident answer. It was a commitment answer. He said, look at it. Verse 17 goes on to say this. It says, uh, uh, if, if it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fire furnace, and he will deliver us out of thine hand, O king. But if not, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. Be it known, we will not serve your gods or worship the image that you're forcing us to bow down to. We're not going to do it. Now that's commitment. In other words, if we burn to death, we burn to death. They're leaving it all in the hands of the Lord. But they are doing right. 
If you obey God and trust God, it will cost you possibly. It, you must be willing even for, to, be, to give your life. It may cost your life. The Trask family last week. Can you imagine? Those three are... Now it's going to be those two. Go down in there in the bush country. They got drug lords down there. That are playing games, taking over airports. That, that they have they've cleared off grass airports, landing strips. Taking over their places and stuff. And yet, they go down there. Jump in the boat on the river. Tell the gospel one more day. be pretty easy to burn them out wouldn't it you know what you know the difference between them and me they're ready to give their life today and the truth of the matter is I'm not much worried about it I don't even have to face the issue But you know, they always have modern communist China. They, the Christians have always in our generation had to face it. And piles have given their lives just to be able to get somewhere private enough so they can get together and worship and hope they don't get caught. The Gorgi Vins of Russia you get caught worshiping, you get to go to an insane asylum and they get to inject you with that meds and play games with you for however many years and then say, okay, now that we've done our best to try to make you into a, a, just, just a babbling idiot, shock treatments or anything, whatever they've done, everything, every kind of thing they could do. All right, you can go now if you think that you can go without worshiping God. And then you have the Gorgie Vins who'll say, nope, forget it. I'm staying here in an insane asylum. Child of God must be willing to give their lives if, if to obey God if it comes to that. Fifth truth. When you face the fiery trials because of your obedience to God rest assured God will do some things five things here quickly what will he do God will purify you it said in verse 25 that Nebuchadnezzar comes up there looks in the fiery furnace and he said I see four men loose walking in the midst of the fire well loose what do you mean loose well, the Bible said very clearly, it said it's three or four times there. It said that the king's army crowd came in and that they bound them and cast them into the fire. They bound them. But now all of a sudden, Nebuchadnezzar looks in there and they're not. And it said that they were loose and they're walking around. What's God doing? The Lord's purifying their lives. God will purify your life. The, the, bind, the, the stuff that binds us, that this world places on us, and all of us have plenty of it. The stuff that binds you and is so attached to you and, and restricts you from living for God and loving God like you ought to, you'll lose it in the fiery trial of life. God's working a purifying process in your life. He's burning some things off of you that you don't need. 
Malachi 3.3 describes the Lord as a silver smith. He puts silver in a crucible, turn, it turns to liquid, all the scum and impurities come to the top. Then he skims off the top and then he turns the heat up a little more and he knows exactly how much heat to put on it. And, and then next thing you know, some more impurities. And finally after a while, when does he bring that, when does he bring that silver out? When he can see his own reflection in the silver. You say, when am I going to get out of my trial? Whenever I get more conformed to Christ. Whenever I go through this trial and he gets a, a certain bunch of junk out of me that needs to be out of him. Right? That's what Job said. Job 23.10. He said, I'll come forth as gold when he's tried me. Purified gold. God's going to purify us. The song we sang, How Firm a Foundation. The so, this songwriter knew about it. He said, when through fiery trials thy pathway shall lie, my grace all sufficient shall be thy supply. The flame shall not hurt thee. I only design, God designed it, thy dross to consume and thy gold to refine. God will purify you. Count on it. God's going to do something in your fiery furnace. He'll purify you. Secondly, He will partner with you. It says that there were four men in there. Well, they only threw three in. And then Nebuchadnezzar says, and the fourth, the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. You know what that means? In their fiery trial, the Son of God's with them. He's in the fiery trial with them. I love Leaning on the everlasting arms, 147 there. Listen to what it says. What have I to dread? What have I to fear? Leaning on the everlasting arms. I have blessed peace with my Lord so near. See? There's the key. He shows up with them. Leaning on the everlasting arms. Safe and secure from all alarm. All alarm. Leaning on the everlasting arms. God will partner with you. You'll find he'll show up in your fiery trial. Thirdly, God will protect you. If verse 25 says, and they have no hurt. Almighty God's protecting his people. See, they didn't burn. Now that's a miracle. The God who created fire can fireproof you. Right? He can. Jesus, he came. The, the disciples are out on the sea in the storm of the Sea of Galilee. And there they are. And the storm's raging and the water's coming in. And they're going to drown. And they know they're going to drown. And Jesus comes walking to them on the water. And the next thing you know, he gets in the ship. When he, he, he just tells the water. He said... Peace be still. The storm stopped. Peace be still. And all of a sudden, the Son of God said, they're fixing to throw my boys in there, in that fiery furnace down there in Babylon. And he made a quick trip. And the pre-incarnate Christ is in the fiery furnace. And he said to the fire. Well, I don't know whether he said it, but I like to think he said it. He said, cool it. <laughs> and they throw him in there. And all of a sudden the boys fall down. And they, next thing you know, they're all loose and they just get up. And there's the Son of God. In the furnace with them. And it's a miracle. The protecting hand of God is a miracle here. Look, look here at verse number 27. And the princes, governors, and all, they saw, and it said, The fire had no power, whose body the fire had, and nor was a hair of their head singed, neither was their coats changed, nor the smell of fire had passed on them. Didn't even have the smell of smoke on them. 
didn't have the smell of smoke. God will protect you. God will pr prove himself. He'll prove himself to you. He, he blesses the obedient. Those who are obeying. We have three who are obeying and God blesses them. He proves himself to them. He will prove himself to you. You start, you just start putting into practice. You don't know it all, but just put into practice what you know that God wants in your life. And see if God won't bless you. He'll prove himself to you. He will. I, I read about it in Malachi. He said, just bring the tithe. He said, prove me now herewith. If I'll open the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing. And tend to all the stuff that's eating your crop up. <laughs> right? That's what he said. God will prove himself. But it, none of that. What's he doing in all of this? He's proving himself to others. As well. Look at verse number 26 of the passage. Nebuchadnezzar came near to the mouth of the burning fire of furnace and spake and said, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, ye servants of the... Listen to how he titles this God. The Most High God. That's the heathen king who's trying to make himself a God. And now his thinking's changing. God's proven himself to him. Come forth out of the midst of the fiery furnace. And then he calls the princes, governors, captains, kings, counselors together. And says they saw the men. And they saw that they that didn't even have the smell of smoke on them. And God proves himself. He says... Uh, Verse 28, then came Nebuchadnezzar spake, said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who hath sent his angel and delivered his servants that trusted in him, have changed the king's word and yielded uh, their bodies that they might not serve nor worship any god except their own god. Therefore, the king makes the decree, this heathen, pagan, Babylonian king, says that every people, nation, language which speak anything amiss against the God of Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego shall be cut in pieces and their houses shall be made a dunghill. We saw him make that same statement in chapter 2. This guy likes cutting people up and turning houses into outhouses or compost heaps or whatever. Because, he said, there is no other God that can deliver after this sort. And that's out of the mouth of an unsaved man. Why? Because God proves himself. Even through fiery trial. You say, well, I'm going through this difficulty. I don't know why in the world I'm going through this difficulty. I'm telling you, somehow it's going to redound to the glory of God. Somehow it's going to redound to somebody being convinced there's a true God. You and others. God will do it. He's in the business of proving that He's God and you're not. King, you can make your own little fake God if you want to, but you're going to find out. You're going to be convinced before it's all said and done that it's nothing. It's just wood overlaid with gold or something. It's not, it's not, can't do a thing for you. I know it's trying to, it's helping your pride to swell, but it's, other than that, it's not doing anything for you. Number five there. God, in the fiery trial when you obey, Rest assured, God will do some things. God will promote you. Verse 30. Then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. They were advanced in their positions, furthered in their growth. They moved forward. God is doing something. Promoting. 
respect. He, he respects these three young fellers. Right? God can do it. So what Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego says in the future, it'll matter. It will count. It'll mean something. They're not just empty talk. These guys are the real deal. One person said a Christian is like a tea bag. Not worth much until you've gone through some hot water. God will put you in it. Fire a furnace. Heat things up in your life. And sometimes just because you're going to obey God. And you're not going to disobey just because somebody's trying to force you to. The, uh, I, I, I took this out of a Wearsby piece. He said, it's a little prayer. Father, thank you for your patience with me. When I think of how many worship experiences I have wasted and how many worship services I have criticized, I feel very ashamed. Thank you for inviting me on this worship pilgrimage and for those who are going with me. Guide us. We have so much to learn. More than anything else, we want to learn to worship you. In the name of Jesus, your Son. Amen. Who and what are you going to worship? We've already got it in, innate in us. We got something in us that is going to worship something. Something's going to be preeminent in our lives. Is it going to be God? The true and living God? And His Son, Jesus Christ, who died at Calvary's cross for us? Who is the only Savior? Who rose the third day? Who's alive and hears the prayers of sinners when they cry out? Is it going to be Him? Or is it going to be something else? What it all comes back down to most of the time is that it comes back to you being your own God. Because I'm wanting to please me. I'm wanting to satisfy me. I'm number one. Even the true and living God who is my creator is secondary. He's not going to be number one. Let's stand. Who or what are you going to worship? Human make, humans make images and idols. Those who are disobeyers will try to turn you into a disobeyer. If you refuse, you can count on it. You'll be attacked and persecuted. The child of God must obey God even if it cost us our lives. But rest assured, when you obey God and you face a fiery trial, God will do some things. God will work. He will purify you. He will partner with you. He will protect you. He will prove himself. And he will promote you. Those are the truths of worship. 
in Daniel 3. Thank you, Father, for inviting me on this worship pilgrimage. More than anything else, we want to learn to worship you. Thank you for your patience with me. When I haven't worshipped right. Forgive us for our idol making heart. Our Father, thank you this morning for the challenge of Daniel 3. Thank you for these three young men and their wonderful example to us. Lord, I pray you'll give us the kind of comfort and courage and to stand, to do right, to make right decisions in a world that's doing its best to force us to disobey. Grant us what we need is our prayer. And we'll trust you for it in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.